Hey, what's up? It's me, Brian Drake, here on the Dice Tower, and our second edition of, we don't really have a title for these, they're interviewing amazing people in the business side of the hobby, the industry, and all that stuff. Today, we have a very special guest, one of my favorite people in the industry. This is Stephen Bonacor, the president of Stronghold Games, as well as the, tell me tell me again, I messed up the title a minute ago, what was the second thing? It was and the spokesperson for person. Indie Game Studios, which is the merged company of Stronghold Games and Indie Boards and Cards. We merged uh, in the middle of the summer last year with a big announcement on the Dice Tower Live show at Gen Con. So, hey, Brian, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. As you can see, I'm wearing my reds. I'm wearing my Stronghold reds. But, well, I'm also wearing my Florida shirt here with my with my sunglasses because <laughs> you're keeping me from my pool, man. This is like, you say. know. This is like um, happy hour here in Florida about cool, right now cool when 30. we're recording this. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, you, you look like, like Florida in, in, a, in a box right there is what it looks like. It looks amazing. So I'm, I'm excited to see the, yeah. the Florida. <laughs> and we're just well, one state open in Alabama. But uh, it, we just, yeah. we're just hot without the class is what I'm basically saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll take the sunglasses off now so I can actually, like, see the screen and things there like that. <laughs> I'm, leaving, I'm gonna leave on the 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 floral shirt for my uh, for going in the pool later. How's that sound? I mean, not 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 for me. I mean, you don't have to just for my benefit. I'm just <laughs> well, I don't think I should take the shirt off. That might get Tom a little crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think I think there will be a comment storm at that point. So it'll be fun, you know. But uh, no, man, it's it's been fun. I've been looking forward to to talking with you. You were definitely uh, right up there on my on my list of people to talk to. It just worked out schedule wise uh, to to finally make this happen. So I'm excited to kind of just pick your brain on all things in the hobby, the industry, everything like that. You know, all the tough questions, all the easy questions, all that sort of stuff. So uh, first of all, real quick, lightning round question. This was not anything we talked about beforehand. Uh -oh. What's your favorite movie of all time? My favorite movie of all time. It's easy. Lord okay. of the Rings, man. I'm a huge, huge Tolkien nerd. And, you know, basically creating a 14 hour movie is really what they did. Like, because it's one, you know, even though it's three movies for various reasons, it's just one epic 14 hour movie based on those books. And it's, you know, nothing will ever be done as, as, as wonderful as that. So that's absolutely my favorite. And my favorite game, because people ask me, is War of the Ring, which is by far the most thematic. Uh, and you know, thematic game ever done as well as its mechanics are always so perfect that every game it comes down to either Frodo just dunking the ring in in Mount Doom or getting corrupted by the ring or the last stronghold on Middle Earth getting taken over by the Shadow Player. It's uh, I like it's what you did there. Amazing. Yeah, she like me saying stronghold. There. <laughs> yeah, any, anytime you say so, I want to keep account. That's what they called in the game. They call strongholds. <laughs> no, I, I have my confession is I've never actually played it, and I love Tolkien, man. I'm a huge like deep dive Tolkien nerd, and I've never played War of the Ring because I just haven't got my hands on it. So one yeah, of these days, find a guy who knows how to play it, and they'll take you through it, uh, and you will love it. I, I promise you'll love this game. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited. You know, Fantasy Flight just did the uh, the one with the with the app, so I've been playing that a little bit. But I've got to get my hands on the big epic war style game of uh, of War of the Ring. But uh, that's good to know, actually, man. And Lord of the Rings, yeah, that's an excellent choice. But you're right, though. There's only like 30 minutes between each movie. It's not like uh, uh, Star Wars, where there's like maybe a two year, maybe a six month <laughs> of gap. We don't know, but it's like 30 <laughs> minutes, you know, so. So let's let's dive into this, man. Let's talk uh, as far as um, as far as the the hobby. Let's 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 pull the curtain back. A lot of people know yeah. you. You're you're a great personality, and, and that's Thank the thing you. too. That's why I wanted to put you on cameras. You're not just uh, like one of those brains behind games and all that sort of stuff, and brains behind companies. You also are a great personality on off camera, and all that sort of stuff. So no, absolutely, man. You you do a great job in making the hobby fun and making the whole industry feel fun, and and um, and that's a good thing. Obviously, that the more of that, the better. But let's pull back the curtain. Now, this might be someone's first interview with you. This might be someone's like 37th interview with you watching. So for those of you, we'll do like I call it the Stan Lee model. This might be someone's <laughs> first issue of Spider-Man. Give me the give me the backstory. Who is Stephen Bonico when it comes to pre-gaming, post-gaming, all that sort of stuff? And I'm just going to kind of stop you and roll in between as we yeah, do this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so first of all, um, I've been a gamer all my life. I mean, you know, from playing Monopoly and – sorry and trouble and all that silly mass market stuff with the family you know all the way through obviously to the present time and um and i did all kinds of styles of gaming throughout that period of time you know during the 
uh, the the rise of the personal computer. I got into computer gaming, and, and then I got into like Magic: The Gathering and CCGs, and uh, got into MMOs on computers again. So kind of like ebb and flow there. And then you know, in like the the late '90s and early 2000s, when you know the the hobby board game was really rising and all of these games started pouring in from Europe, Rio Grande being the big company yep. in the U S that was doing that. And uh, thank you to Jay Tummelson for like basically starting the U S industry. It was amazing uh, what Rio Grande did. Um, I realized that what I liked best about gaming was sitting around a table, socializing with friends, possibly having an adult beverage and <laughs> Possibly. And just enjoying <laughs> our company together. And it wasn't about sitting in front of a screen and 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 either trying to like, you know, shoot things up or or solve puzzles or or do an MMO. That's a little bit together. But and and now, you know, with all of this, you know, right. you're on a phone in this, you know, it's almost a revolt against technology that board games are having this surge. So that's my board game history, and this is why I came full circle to to gaming, to hobby board gaming. It is, it, I'm a social person, obviously. I like people, as you can see. So being around people and hanging out and doing the thing together is is what keeps me and drives me uh, to be a gamer in hobby board gaming. No, you're right though. I, I think you're absolutely right with that point. It's almost like it's a revolt. That's why it's so popular because the yeah. zeitgeist of the time is insular, uh, you know, cell phones, your smartphones, your tablets, and you're all here. I mean, even me, I, I'm, I'm guilty of this. When I go in like Walmart, Target somewhere, I always have my headphones and I'm always listening to something where it's insular, <laughs> you know? And so that moment of breaking out of that is nice. I mean, I always, I always tell the story. We reconnected with our, our best friends, you know, over board games. We hadn't seen them in probably since high school. And now we're as close as can be you know our kids play together and all that sort of that's stuff that's wonderful yeah all because of gaming and stuff like that so it's a great uh it's a great just way to get people together you're right so so you've been in it for the long haul then uh what I'll tell you what what's your favorite of the classic the old school games those kind of family mass market games because that's that's a tricky topic because everybody likes to do the oh monopoly is the worst but everybody played it as a kid you know everybody enjoyed it as a kid and has mo fond moments of that you know memories of that sure um, well, I say I, as a kid, you you probably played it when you were like, you know, like in your 30s or something like that when it came out, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm always uh, ageism in the industry. Here we go. Make fun of right. Monaco. I'm always the oldest person in any gaming circle, so I'm okay with that. I'm okay. It just means you're wise. That's it. That's right. Yeah, I'm a wise guy. I'm a wise guy, hey, you know. Right. So, um, you know, my favorite games from back in the day are going to be like the weird ones like like that came out like Voice of the Mummy and these weird things that came out under like Milton Bradley and stuff. And King Oil was a, was a big game um, where you were dropping these oil wells on various areas of the of the board. And just, it was this like three um, three layered board like that you right. rotated every time to start the game. And when you put like an oil well there, it could either fall all the way through like all those three layers, or it might be up a little bit or up a lot or a gusher. If it like hit, hit the, the first, the yeah, first layer cool. there. So when you get made money, it was an economic game about drilling oil and, and that, that cool board, it, that's actually been reprinted in a, in various ways, but well, I got I one of those say, originals. I, I thought so, but that sounds, that sounds really fun. It's just the <laughs> idea. A fan of me and Stronghold actually heard me say I thought I'd want a copy of that again, and he actually gave me a copy at a convention. I don't remember the guy's name. That's I'm awesome. sorry, but that was just yeah. I have so many of those like little things, like people people now bring me beer. I don't know right. at right. conventions. They hear me on my <laughs> podcast, Board Games Insider, with Ignacy Chevychek and Stephen Bonacore. So you know we have a, a, a weekly, biweekly <laughs> podcast, uh, Ignacy from Portal Games and myself, and um, we. You know, we talk about the, the industry, and I talk about beer too, and he talks about tea and cookies because that's what he likes. So people now come to conventions, and they literally say, "I have brought you this gift from my local brewery. Will you accept this?" And I'm like, "Yes, I will. Thank you very much. It's very just that's a very funny. nice." So that would be my my second biggest hobby uh, would be uh, the craft brewing industry, right? Which is booming <laughs> and humongous as, as well, you know. And I've been in that actually as as long as well my adult life, and, and as long as gaming, I've been i was a home brewer back in the day like in the in the 80s and 90s and uh, just enjoyed that portion of it as well so uh it's been and that's been booming and booming more and more over time yeah i mean they, well, they only recently passed laws that <laughs> made it where you could in some places you know <laughs> Sorry, it's, so. it might have been illegal when yeah. i was doing it back yeah then. <laughs> i was about to say you might be you might have just admitted a felony on <laughs> <laughs> statute uh, of 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's got to be passed by now. Um, so you were in, and a lot of people know this, and and I I knew this, but I like it because it's in the notes too that you told me. But I knew this, and I just it, some of the things you forget. You did something else before you got into the industry. But what yeah. was that? What was that gap that really bridged between IT and what you do now as president of Stronghold? So um, yeah, so my entire career, um, I I got uh, my undergraduate degree. Again, I'm aging myself here in uh, '83, and my graduate degree, I got an MBA in the in the in 1996. So during the, from '83 onward, I was um, in IT on Wall Street for various companies. Uh, so like a 35 year period before I actually left that. But in the end tale of that, um, you know, and I mentioned before that I was kind of Got getting into just the physically getting into board games, uh, late '90s, early 2000s, and I was watching the rise of the of hobby board gaming, and there were a lot of companies, not Rio Grande, who were doing it right and doing a great job, but there were a lot of other companies out there that you could see it, they were not bringing business sense. There was no business model to it, and I was looking at things, and I'm like, you know, I bet I can do this and do this better. So, right. um. Then, you know, toward the latter part of the 2000s, the ODs, um, this little thing occurred where, like, you know, Lehman Brothers, and I was working for them in IT, not, not the business <laughs> side, <laughs> almost brought yeah, down the world say, economy. That. <laughs> so, so after that fiasco, uh, you know, I moved over to another company uh, and got established there, was doing fine. And But in late 2009, I started Stronghold Games uh because I thought I could do things better um, and uh, bring a business sense and bris- business discipline to the industry and to a game company, um, but also to chart my own my own life, you know, so that I right. wouldn't have to at some point rely on um, major companies to make a living. Uh, I figured that stronghold would would get me to a point where I could then retire out of IT and right. then do this as a retirement job, but things accelerated. And in like 2015, I realized that there's no way that I can do both of these jobs. So by mid 2016, I separated myself from, uh, from IT, started doing stronghold games full time, would have been happy at the size of the company at that time. But right. a little thing occurred called terraforming Mars. Yeah. And that was <laughs> after I left, which absolutely exploded. And, you know, that sort of propelled stronghold games to uh to another to a whole nother level uh within the industry and that obviously is a a huge thing for us and it incentivized another company indie boards and cards my good friend travis worthington friends for many years started his company around the same time as i started mine and we started talking about uh, a strategic merger that could happen between those two games and that obviously strong uh, having having terraform mars was definitely a a big part of that whole thing Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, and what a, and what a hit it is, right? But, uh, but really that, that's that's fascinating to see. You came in at such a – that's a weird year if you think about it, 2009. Because, I mean, to, most people date kind of the birth of the modern boom of golden age of board gaming now that we're in. What, around 2005, maybe a little earlier? Obviously, you have the the, the 90s and stuff like that, the, the mm-hmm. you know, the Catans and stuff coming in. But th- that's a real sweet spot. And so you're right in the middle of that. Right. Did you when, you, when you came in, were you thinking – Maybe this is a bubble. And there was a lot of people who still referred to it as a bubble, even to like, you know, a few years ago. And now we see it's a roaring industry that, that shows really no signs of slowing down. It's not like it's a uh, it's not like it's a froyo shop, you know, that pops up on every <laughs> corner and then the bubble <laughs> pops and it goes away. You right, know? Right. So I, what, what did you when you jumped in at that time? Was it I know you just said you were kind of hoping maybe you could retire mm-hmm. out of uh, IT, but it would did it did you see I guess obviously no one foresees the success that you yeah. guys have. But, you know, I mean, did you foresee Anything like that happening? Or was it the idea of, well, we'll kind of just be a small company and stay a small company and do it like that for as long as we can? Or was your goal, hey, let's make this as monumental as we can? Well, now, that's a weird question because everybody know, hopes it's, that. It's a little bit of both, right? Um, I, You can never predict the future. I saw the growth. I saw that what things were happening. I saw it look like it was getting bigger year over year, not only the industry uh, and the games and the gamers and everything. Um, so... I, I did not believe that it would become certainly what it is now. I don't think anybody really could predict that hobby games would become. But I think the trigger was once enough Amer- 
and I'm not trying to be, you know, American centric here, but I'm, what I'm saying is that <clears throat> the Germans knew about it already. And a lot of people in Europe knew about it already. Uh, the Netherlands, I don't know if you know this, the Netherlands actually have the highest per capita board game consumption in the world, know that. followed closely by Germany. So those, are, so those countries got it a while back. Right. The Americans didn't have a clue. Every time they see somebody playing a board game, it's like, oh, is that like Monopoly? And exactly. <laughs> there's these great T-shirts. I saw them this week. We were just at BGG Con Spring in Dallas. Somebody was wearing that that T-shirt. No, it's not like Monopoly is what it says on the T-shirt. <laughs> so that's the standard answer that you got to have when people come up to you, right? Um, so I did not predict it. Um, I, I had it in the back of my head that certainly something really great could happen here. And I ran the company, and I did this from the beginning. Uh, I ran the company as if, at some point, the company would be big enough to make a merger, to make a sale. So I ran the books tight. I ran it such that anybody who wanted to look at this company would say, wow, he put some smarts behind this. It was a, it was a thought that it could happen, but it, it wasn't the end goal. The end goal was simply to get something. I can do this, enjoy it, a passion job, and then retire as right. – do this as my retirement job. No, that's good. And, and that's that's funny because, like I said, the last one, the last of these episodes we did was with Jamie Stegmar, you know, obviously a designer, uh, also, you know, head of his but, company, but a but designer. He is a publisher, man. He is, yeah, he he's is, also a publisher. He's the smartest guy in the world. He's such a great guy, too. Jamie he's as both designer and as publisher, and he's got a great niche and, uh, and a wonderful human being, too. Lovely yeah, guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, really, really great guy. But the thing is, we focused a lot on designing with him. And the one thing I want to focus on really today uh, in, in the in the time we have left would be that the idea of publishing, because it's it's a thing that you know so many people I see online and probably at conventions too. It's like, hey, I designed this game. Can I show it to you? Can I show it to you? Can I show it to you? But you don't see a lot of people like, hey, I want to publish games. I want to publish games. You know, it's not as it doesn't have the appeal quite as honestly, but it's still <laughs> so cru crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I call the unsung heroes of the industry is the publishers, because if you have a design and you can't publish the thing, no right. one's going to play it except you, you know? So, right. so walk me through the process. What does that look like maybe when you started and maybe now as far as producing, not giving away trade secrets of this is how you get a game published yeah. at Stronghold, but what I mean is what does that look like for you? What are you looking for when it comes to that then and now? Right. So um, it's an interesting progression with Stronghold. When, we, when, when, the, when the company first started, <clears throat> I was specifically – um, looking to reprint older games. So if you look at the first three games that were in the catalog, it was Code 777, Confusion, which was not a very known quantity, but it was a game that was printed out in Germany. And the third one was Survive, Escape from Atlantis, right. uh, which still is um, it's probably my, it's my biggest, second biggest selling game uh, now after Terraforming Mars. It's a, it's a, it's a truly an evergreen as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the original model, find these great games from hopefully also from great designers. And people would then say like, oh, I really wanted a copy of Survive and I haven't been able to find it for 10 years. Who are these guys stronghold? Well, I'll give them a shot. So you build your brand by great game already known, great designer already known. Who are these stronghold guys? Let me try them out. So right. that's how we, that was the thought. After that, because that well was going to run dry. Obviously, it's kind <laughs> of dry now, though we are still finding some things and bringing some things back. We'll talk about that maybe later on, like Egesia, sure. which we have on Kickstarter right now. Um, so then we started looking at uh, new games from from either known or unknown designers. So we got in the in the beginning, we got Core Worlds from uh, from Andrew Parks and mm -hmm. uh, Space Cadets from Jeff Engelstein. He was an unknown designer. Uh, right. He had just got it just gotten started and just starting his podcast and now and he's been on the dice tower uh and now he's you know a phenomenon in and of himself too so started reprints got to that and now with the merge company we are you know oh and then i, f I forgot to mention then we also went out to great publishers out in europe and right. brought back games from them and that was and that was a little bit like the rio grande uh, model they were doing that and Z-Man games. Z-Man was doing many, mm -hmm. many of those. Those are during the Zev days, right. not necessarily during the, the the company who bought them or now um, being owned by Asmodee. So right. that became and still is um, the biggest part of us bringing out new games, going out uh, to to publishers out in Europe, 
finding great games and bringing them across the pond. You you end up can do, you end up doing many more games because it takes a lot less work to localize a game, license it, right. create it, you know, get the English correct and slap your logo on. Uh, that's a lot less work than taking a game from the ground up that's just mm-hmm. a prototype, pieces of paper, and maybe some cardboard if you're lucky, and, and wood, and taking that from the ground up all the way to a produced product. Um, so there's three different possible ways of entry into a into the stronghold, into stronghold games. Um, none of them is will none of them dominates the other right. um, from a perspective of what we're looking for. Uh, right. Though though I have focused on getting licensed games uh, mostly because you can just do more of them versus doing games well, from the ground up. And they have a tested audience as well. I mean, you're coming and from somewhere that already has a tested audience, and, yeah. which it, the, I want to say, is that what happened with Terraforming Mars? Obviously, we've got to talk about it. It's a fantastic game in its mm-hmm. own right. But is that what happened with Terraforming Mars? It was you, you saw a game or you kind of found them? Or how did that work? No, so that's a, that's sort of a hybrid there, and that's a very good question. Okay. So Terraforming Mars, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit dry. Yeah. Um, Terraforming Mars um, uh, is designed by uh, Jacob Frixelius, right. who is part of uh, the design house, the design team of Frix Games out in Sweden. So what what Frix Games did was they they had this design, they were looking for partners. They themselves are not truly a publisher themselves. They're a design house. Um, so through contacts in the industry, I found out that they were looking to publish, uh, get this game published, and they were looking for partners around the world. And English is very important. It's the it's the by far the biggest selling language right. uh, of gaming. So I got introduced to them, and we worked with them for over a year to develop that game to be what it is now. So um, the game was not ready, neither from a design perspective, nor was it a, a game that was already out. They showed us the game, the prototype, we played it, I'm like, this is very interesting, this has got some great stuff, but we need to make some, we need to add some more development to this. So I got a good friend of mine, Jeff Gamble, who, um, who was also a podcaster as well for a while, uh, and Jeff worked tirelessly with them and other groups to get the game to where it is now. Uh, and once we did, Frix Games ends up delivering the way that they work. They end up delivering a finished product because right. they have 16, you don't believe this, 16 brothers and sisters that <laughs> have some role in the company. That's how many do. <laughs> Not everyone does something, but that's absolutely true. Uh, Jacob is one of, is one of the designers. <laughs> Enoch is the president. Isaac is the graphic designer. Uh, and of course they need outside illustrations and things like that as well. But sure. they do all the work, they get it all, all together and then they localize it. They'll do the localization for stronghold and they'll do the localization for the Germans and then the Polish. Right. There's now 20 partners involved, 20 different language partners involved, at least. There might even be 21 or so uh, in a in a project for Stronghold Games, which is which is phenomenal. It's truly a, cool. a phenomenon. Uh, and we do we do more than half of the of the print run on on every time we print with them. So which is pretty, pretty great. Well, it cracks me up because I we love Terraforming Mars, Carl and I both. Um, and it's one of those games I I bought. This is prior to me doing reviews. Although when I did the review, it's my most hated review of all time. I just I shot it weird. People hate that video, but that's fine. I just, you know? Do it again. <laughs> they'll they'll, they'll <laughs> love it if you do it again. Like it's it's it yeah. I, I still go and look at the the stats and just be like, man, I'm sorry guys. But um, um, shoot it again. If you don't have the expansions, we'll send you expansions. You yeah. can talk about them as well. How's that? That's a good idea. That's, that makes more sense. But uh, <laughs> it was one of those games where it, when it came out, you know, it was nowhere. You could not find it. Just boom, it sold out like crazy. And so our local game shop had a copy. I checked their inventory and I was like, you have one to stop? He said, yeah. So I ran over there and got it for Carlos's birthday. I was like doing that thing where you roll the dice, like, please like this game because I want it and I'm getting it for your birthday. <laughs> So, but it worked out great. She loves the game, and it's just—it's awesome. been such a massive hit for you guys. But I mean, you guys have uh, just a great catalog in general, and I've always liked the great designer series in general, just because the idea of it's almost like a comic book company doing the thing where you're like, hey, we've got, you know, Jeff Johns writing a comic, or just guest writers coming in and writing these, you know, things. So even though that may not be the process, that's the that's the appearance of it. Is like the great designers is, hey, these guys are doing these games for Stronghold, and it's this cool series where it's your favorite designers doing these fantastic games. So uh, I've really yeah. enjoyed that series. Thank you. Yeah, that we, we, and and I and I like to I'm I'm paying in doing it that way with the great designers series. I'm paying an homage to to really those in this industry 
who who you know without them there is no me right so right. without without a designer there is no publisher there is no games uh and i want those those men and women's names known as much as the game's name as much as the publisher's name so i've had i've had and continue to have the ability to work with Uva Rosenberg, Freedom yeah. and Freeze, Martin Wallace, Jeff Engelstein. I put him in that in that pantheon right yeah. now. Um, uh, Matthias Kramer. I mean, it just goes on and on. And we've had some so so much success in in finding these uh, designers to work with and getting them to work with us. And very very proud and excited to to continue to do that. No, it's it's a great idea. It's just a great line. And like I say, just spotlighting those people is a fantastic idea because, like you said, know them, know hobby pretty much, you know, I mean, at that that's point. Right. But, again, that's not to discourage anybody who's like, well, I can't be a Uwe Rosenberg. Well, of course you can if you if you try and, and you know, do your best at making a game. There are people who are gifted at that. I am not. That is, that is yeah. not my gift at coming up with a game. I, I always say I'm not smart enough to be a designer. I'm a right. good enough <laughs> businessman and I'm a good enough gamer to know what – to know what games what games are good, but I am not good smart enough to be a designer, and I and I give them all the all the props in the world for being for being those guys and and women. That's very true. Well, I, obviously, you know Harper, our daughter, our five year old, her favorite game from you guys is Gold Fever, hands down. Awesome. Because it's, it's fun. She loves it. So uh, I know that that's that's uh, that's the one we did on the Dice Tower cruise. We did the uh, the the trick and brought you up on stage and did yeah. a mentalism trick with that. So that was uh, that was always <laughs> fun. But. Uh, so what's uh, what's coming next then for for Stronghold Games? I mean, obviously, long term, short term. I, mean, I know the list of games that are coming out, but what what do you like? It's hard to say, obviously. But what would you? What is your goal going forward in the next few years? Like, what do you want to see happen to the industry, to Stronghold, and maybe just personally in gaming? Well, that's a that's very general question. But yeah. what I yeah. I mean, Have what fun I really like that. <laughs> packed a lot into that. Um, but um. Some of the things I really uh, like to see is is people to focus on those companies uh, that that have consistently brought out great games and you, they know that they can deliver. And obviously, that's the the top game companies, and that would be Stronghold uh, amongst them. Right now, the industry does have a a slight problem. Um, there there are too many games. There's too much product sure. coming out. Um, so even the alpha gamers, even guys like you and guys like me, we, we can't, we can't weed through all of the different games, the products that are coming out there. So print run sizes have had to come down just because you, you have a new product. There's not enough people that find out and know about the games. So I'm hoping that, um, through, through a little bit of osmosis, I think we're going to see some companies having to exit because of, of things like this. This doesn't mean a bubble is bursting, and that's sort of a no, separate thing. No, 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 not thing. at all. We, the, the market is still expanding mm -hmm. at a slower rate, but it's ex, it's still expanding. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that the cream is going to rise. Uh, there's going to be some, uh, some exits from the industry on both the publishing level and on the dis distribution level. So that's kind sure. of neg negative news. But I think you're going to see more consolidations. Consolidations are good in a healthy industry. That's not a, that's not a problem. Uh, right. so, so more mergers, some more acquisitions. Uh, and I think you're going to see publishers in general, so those top tier publishers, bringing out less games to sort of help drive sales in people's eyes to their core titles and their key titles. Um, right. So that's my view of the next couple of years in the industry. You're still going to see thousands of games coming out. Oh, absolutely. And Essen, <clears throat> Gen Con to a lesser degree, and Essen definitely. We're still going to see lots and lots and lots of games, but I think you're going to see a lot of one-hit wonders uh, among that. And uh, then the the big, bigger companies with the, with the more powerful marketing engines are going to show their stuff off, and uh, I think that they're going to succeed very well. Well, and, and let me play devil's advocate for a little bit because I actually agree mm -hmm. with what you just said 100%. I, I think that's the best thing for the industry as far as going forward. But what do you what do you say if if the, so devil's advocate the guy says or the girl says, hey, well, what about me, the small time you know intro publisher? Well, if if that's the case, if we're and you may not have the answer for this right this second, that's fine. But how do you? How do I get my game out there amongst all this craziness, but I don't have access to, you know, this company. I don't have access to this company. What's the advice you would give someone, maybe a designer as yeah. a publisher to say, hey, well, here's how you can still do that mm -hmm. in a crowded industry? Because crowded industry does, like you said, doesn't mean the bubble's bursting. It, it actually yeah. means it's increasing, you know? Yeah. As a publisher, I think uh, a new publisher is going to have a lot of problems. They've got to they've find something that's absolutely way outside the box. 
Obviously, they're going to use Kickstarter. That's great. We are, for the first time, leveraging Kickstarter yeah. due, due to the partnership with Indie Boards and Cards. Um, they, they've they got infrastructure to do so, expertise. They've run 50 now at this point between right. Indie Boards and Cards, Stronghold, and Action Phase Games, which was acquired by Indie Boards and Cards two and a half years ago. They've done 50 Kickstarters successfully. So uh, new publishers, you're going to have to be on Kickstarter. You're going to have to find things outside the box. And you're probably going to have to do things that have bling, 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 have like, you know, miniatures and this. So this, you got to have to – it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard for you to do that. So I would I would recommend if you're just a somebody who's got a game and wants to get it out there, probably not to try to do it that way because right. it's going to be too big of a thing. Try to get your games to to know and establish publishers. How does one do that? So for the designers, you're going to want to follow procedures that publishers have established. Every publisher publishes their <clears throat> information on their web page on you have a game, you want to submit it to us, here's what you have to do. You know, with Stronghold and Indie Boards and Cards, you uh, send an email to a specific address. It's on my website. Uh, right. I'll, do, I'll mention it. Submissions at yeah, strongholdgames.com. No, I'm going to get you to plug everything you want to plug, too, because <laughs> I, I want to make sure that. No, I mean, Thank really. I, I want to. No, absolutely. Submissions at strongholdgames.com, <laughs> and you must have a sell sheet for the game. That's uh, basically the hard facts and some view of the way you want the game to, to look. You're going to want to... Uh, have, a, have a rule set so that can be reviewed. Make sure it's not just you writing them. Make sure you get that and make sure it's very clear for other people to look at. And very, very importantly, you want to do a video that you're showing right. how your game works on the table. It doesn't have to be the prettiest thing. It could be paper and little meeples that you stole out of Catan or something like that right. or, <laughs> you know, or, or things like that. And you just want to make sure that people understand how you can uh, – how the game is played. Sh send that off to – as many publishers as makes sense. You right. wouldn't want to send uh, a child, a children's game to Stronghold Games because we don't do children's right. games, right? right? You wouldn't want to send a game <clears throat> that probably has 200 plastic miniatures in a game to Stronghold Games. That is obviously a fantasy flight type of game, <laughs> yeah. right? So make sure the publishers that you're targeting are the ones that would end up doing such right. a game. That's very important. And importantly, if you're really serious about this, it's going to cost you money to get to conventions, to meet more people, to get yourself known, to get inside the industry. There are lots of designers that are not part of that pantheon of great designers that sure. literally got themselves known because they were at every major convention being nice people, talking to publishers, talking to me. Uh, and once you get yourself known, that's a foot in the door. You get right. that much more credibility that much more uh time and face time with a, with a publisher because they'll say like oh hey john hey cindy come over let's talk let's have a drink and let's I mean, show me what do you what do you got going on right now so i can't uh, talk about that enough you're not going to get rich most likely as right. a designer a new designer industry you're going to be doing it for the love of the game and if That's you right. get lucky and if you got the right thing for the right <laughs> publisher you get in there <laughs> and you make a little bit of money doing so Right. Well, and that's the thing. Like, it's it's such a it's such a a thing that we've lost almost just in generally in any industry that's kind of got an artistic side to it is the is the notion of patience. So you do have to have a little bit of patience in that. Uh, with what we do, you know, as magicians, you know, we 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 have different trade shows and different things that we go to and exhibit. You know, hey, have us out at your event. And there are things that we're doing this year that have literally we started the greased wheels working for ten years ago. I mean, so it's it, wow. I would say that you know you can't. And again, it may not obviously take that long for board gaming, but because it's a different thing as opposed to selling yourself you're selling an actual mm -hmm. product but I, I think people just there, there's a great book called quitter by a guy named john acup that talks about this if you want to take your hobby and make it your career you have to have that patience and you don't just dive headlong without a plan you know and so right going and doing the work doing the doing the work that's not the fun work the rubbing elbow or you know elbow rubbing yeah. some of that it's not fun if you don't have that kind of personality, but it's the nature of the beast nowadays. You have to do that kind of stuff. You and have so to do it. I think what you just laid out, all of those things you laid out would make a great like uh, course or PDF or video or something <laughs> like that. People would be like, hey, how do I design a game? But, you know, it, it's one of those things people hear a lot, but it needs to be said over and over and over. So it's not, well, they're just mean. They don't want my game. Well, maybe it's not time, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe for a little it's work, not but, time. Yeah. Hey, so, I'll plug Jeff Engelstein is yeah. a new, new book. He's coming out with a book. Oh, yeah. Uh, written with i forgot now oh, i apologize jeff but it's it's about all the game mechanics every notable game mechanic out there i think it's essentially required reading 
for any new game designer. Uh, and I guess maybe I'll at the same time mention the game in our catalog called 504, which yes. is a way that Freedom and Freeze basically showed how game mechanics and theme and flavor can all be interwoven. So you select this mechanic and this mechanic and this flavor and you play that exact game and there's 504 different games in that box, combinations of games. Um, so I, those are like two textbooks right there for yeah. any new game There's designer game that might be out there. I think maybe that's his. Yeah, maybe. No, he's got a couple of books. He's got yeah, Game Tech. Is like his all the stuff he did on. No, he Math, did on. Science, or, that's on, right. Um, yeah. On uh, on the Dice Tower, and now he's got a new book coming out. That's gotcha. almost it's a textbook regarding game mechanics that he that one could use in a in a course he's they're actually publishing it like a textbook for um uh for for a course that's going to be done i believe so i, I, and I love, apologize to jeff for not knowing the, the name of no his absolutely uh I, I love the idea of 504 for that reason because it's i heard somebody describe what they were doing a review of it and i own it it's right over there on the shelf and i've, I've oh thank spent, you oh I, I love the concept and the idea somebody said hey this is a great way if you're a designer play with this, you know, play with this idea, just mess around with it, you know, use it as a game, sure, have fun with it as a game, but use it as a tool too, you know, and so that's, that's yeah. an interesting idea. Note the linkages between the mechanisms and how, how you should yeah. think about it. And that's exactly what, um, you know, well, what that game is about. Even just the idea of, well, if you tweak this and make it where this is how you get money instead of how you get points, that's huge in any game. Sure. You know what I mean? Like the idea, especially Euro, but obviously not not Batman. It'd be a little bit different if you're like, right. you know? <laughs> but uh, but things like that. So so tell me, what's what are you excited for coming up uh, game wise? What do you guys have coming out that's coming up uh, that you're really excited for? Uh, new Terraform Mars expansions coming? Anything? I know you, one was announced. What was the one that just came out? Or well, we just we just announced. Well, we just did a Kickstarter for. Terraforming Mars Turmoil, which is the, Turmoil, fifth, that's the one. fifth expansion that'll be coming out at the end of the year. Uh, if you mix, if you if you got it in the Kickstarter, awesome. You'll also get the new Dooley player boards and and a whole stack of promo cards. So that's really cool. If you're not, just wait for that. Probably be released in November of this year. Oh. Terraforming Mars Turmoil available all over the place. Um, if you don't mind me plugging what's happening like right now, right Please now do. on Kickstarter, we have Egizia Shifting Sands. This is a reprint. We talked about that Stronghold Games started doing reprints. We got a license for the game Egizia from the original designers, and we did some additional development to come out with a true second edition. Inside the game on the Kickstarter, you'll be able to play the game as the original way if you'd like, or you can play it with the modifications that we made. So we'll have a dual-sided game board for that. This is on Kickstarter right now. We're at about the halfway point on that Kickstarter. My cover so, great. so if you're interested, uh, this is this podcast is going to drop on somewhere around Monday or something like that. Uh, yeah. uh, June, what is that? Third, yes. So yeah, June, you'll have about two more weeks of that Kickstarter. So um, this is a brilliant Euro game where you are floating down the Nile yeah. and taking actions at the various points. Uh, and you can't go upwards on the Nile. So if you get to a certain point, anything you've passed, you will not be able to take those actions. So you have to kind of say, ooh, I really need that thing that's far down there. Uh, so I better go I get do. that now, but I'm going to be missing the other stuff. <laughs> that's and, right. and that's the balance that you take. Um, and you're building the various um, monuments and pyramids of uh, in the in Egizia. Uh, so check that out. Um, that's going to end in about two weeks. Uh, after that, and this is almost a an announcement, almost almost a, an announcement for you because we haven't put anything out except for like look at that sort of a scoop. <laughs> Some people found <laughs> out a video a video came out. We're going to be re-releasing um, D Mocker. Now D Mocker is this yep. heavy heavy Euro game about the German election system. But right. the, the real wild cred on this game is that if you go onto Board Game Geek, it is the number one uh, game in the database. On Board Game Geek. So when Aldi and all the guys on Board Game Geek created the database there, this was the first game that they entered. So if you go, it's like Board Game That's Slash awesome. One. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, it's it has come out in the past in a couple of editions. It has not been in print in a while now. So Spielworks, our strategic partner out in Germany, they got the license. They did some extra development, so there'll be a uh, some streamlining to the game plus the original way to play it. We're going to help them kickstart that game, and that Kickstarter should start on June 18th. So you wait only about uh, two and a half weeks after this drops, and you'll be seeing That's that. Awesome. So 
And that's also going to be a limited edition. We're only putting that on. They're only putting on oh. Kickstarter. Anything that we do after that is going to be fulfilled via the Kickstarter, and that's right. it. So, so get it now is what you're not, saying. <laughs> so basically get it now. If we reprint it, it won't be reprinted. We're guaranteeing until at least 2021 if, oh, wow. yeah. if there is uh, additional – um, demand for the game. So there's going to be at least, you know, a two year lag before any, it comes into distribution if it goes into distribution. Um, and then we're promoting, we, well, let me just talk about a couple of the, of the uh, sure. rolling rights that are, that are street dating either now or in the near, in the near future. We have the follow up for Gan Shun Clever, which we called That's Pretty yeah. Clever in English. Right. Got twice as clever coming out. That is that's just, I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's by the great Wolfgang Warsh. Now, now, um, He's he's been known for these rolling rights because he's he, they gone from clever twice as clever and we're also gonna be coming out with bricks, um, which is like Tetris the rolling right. You know I can't put that in the box, oh, but yeah. I can no, say it's good. It's, yeah, I can say, <laughs> you can say it here like in, you know, in, a, in a video maybe. Um, so his 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 uh, brilliance of literally thinking outside the box for these games. He also did the mind and he did subtext oh, yeah. with us. They're just amazing amazing things that he's doing. And then also Dizzle. Uh, is another roll and write we're coming out with an encore, uh, which was Nachmal in Germany. And Nachmal is the largest selling roll and write uh, in Germany. So, you know, that's a whole new line of games that yeah. we're, we're doing these roll and writes. Um, it's a huge demand you, right now. Once you buy into the system of like, you know, rolling dice and taking the actions, you, you just get it. And it's so much fun. I can go on for right. a long time, but I won't. No, absolutely. I can, I'll bore the entire, I'll bore the audience <laughs> with, with all the releases that we do. But No, it's but, exciting, man. Think about that Stronghold Games is not only going to do those big games, we're also going to do these little rolling rights because we want to be in, you know, we want to be on everyone's shelves. And that's the way that we're getting into the sort of the, the lower end of the market, the cheaper end of the market, um, because these games are are wonderful to produce and great for, for gamers to have to play with their families and things like that. Something for everyone with Stronghold of the Box. I like that. You that's can like, use that. That's it. <laughs> so, my new model, well, that's, baby. That's, that's it, man. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you taking the time, Steve. It's good talking to you, man. Like, so you're just you're, you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the hobby, the industry, and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, tell us where we can find all that. StrongholdGames.com is the best place, or should we go? Are all the links you mentioned you can, there? Or you can find us in StrongholdGames.com, of course. You can sign up for our newsletter. I made sure that link was working. It wasn't working for a while, so now it's. Yeah. Sign up for our newsletter by clicking over there. Um, we have a Facebook page where we're constantly posting things. It's slash Stronghold Games on Facebook. I'm ve- I am personally very interactive on Twitter. So if, you, if you're if you talking to somebody on Twitter, you're probably talking directly to me, and I'm posting <laughs> silly things that goes on. So that's at Stronghold Games there. We have a YouTube channel where we post – we post a lot of our um, uh, videos of our gameplay stuff, so you can check us out there. And please, I tell everybody, at the big convention, so like at Origins, which is coming up, and then Dice Tower Con, which is coming up, and Gen Con after that, come visit the booth. Visit me. Hang out with me. You don't got to bring me beer if you do. Well, that's a cool <laughs> time. You do, but great. If you just want to hang it. out, just talk and look, look at some games, just come out and hang out with us. Uh, we'll teach you the games before you want to play them, uh, before you want to buy them and things like that. So, hey, Brian, thank you so much for having me on. This has thank been you, great. Man. It's uh, it's it's a pleasure to be with you. I, I'm I'm Absolutely. I'm a fan of yours, too, my friend. Oh, I, I loved your stuff from the beginning. <laughs> I loved your stuff from the beginning. I love your magic on the Dice Tower Cruise. We got a chance to like you brought me up on stage to do some of that yep. magic with you. So that was so much fun. So thank you for everything you do as well. I appreciate it very much. Well, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for again for coming on and and we'll uh, we'll see you soon, man. We'll get together and hang out and all that sort of stuff. But uh, are you going to no, Dice Tower Con East? Are you coming out to? I won't be at, I won't be the Dice Tower Con. No, I'll be on. I'm pretty sure I'll be on the cruise again next year, but I won't be on the oh, con I, I, that I can make it. Now, hopefully, maybe something during the fall. I'll try to get out to something. That's my goal. So uh, our schedule's crazy. Crazy in the summer, but but we're excited. So, I hear about but uh, but we'll definitely come hang out and get together. And uh, I look forward to all the stronghold stuff. I'm a big fan, so yeah, it's yeah. gonna be fun. Thank you so much. Cool. Well, thanks again, brother. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. See ya. Bye bye. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.